we're going to switch gears and we're going to ask uh, Reagan to get ready. It looks like she's already ready to go, raring to go. And um, yeah, we're going to talk with Reagan Chastain, which most of you probably know her and know how wonderful she is. And she's, yes, I always tell her she's a national treasure for sure. Uh, so great, so grateful for all her work. Is and she does. I don't know, Reagan. I know you don't sleep a lot. But you get a lot done in a day. So impressive. It's crazy. But and also, I, I just adore. Um, I follow her newsletter, her new sub Substack. I love that. I love your website. And it's. I think your sense your sense of humor is what sometimes just kills me. I love it. So yeah, I feel the same way sometimes. <laughs> uh, but you know. That's all right, so Reagan, we'll turn it over to you. Um, and just want to remind everybody, this is supposed to be fun. And, um, you know, hope you're enjoying this. And we're going to, we kind of keep questions till the end for Reagan so she can get through her presentation. And then I'm, I'm sure probably most of her presentation will answer the questions that you're asking. But if there's any other questions, definitely have time for Q&A. Thank you so much. I'm right back at you on all counts. Thanks, uh, so just, I'm super glad and honored to be in community with you, with the other Thank speakers, you. with the folks who are here. So, hey, everybody. Um, I am going to go ahead and get started with the screen share, hopefully. Uh, oh, hey, I can't screen don't. share. I need um, to make you, um, hang on, I need to sure. you. make host, right? Yeah, make host. Okay, and now you should be able to chat, screen share. Oh, cool beans. And now I have power. Look out. Yes, you have it all the power. All right. Let's mm -hmm. see what I can do here. Let's get my slides going. And if somebody can give me a thumbs up that you can definitely see my slides. Got it. Cool. And now if PowerPoint cooperates, look at that. Already you got to be feeling good about this. Okay. So yeah, this talk is New Year's, same me, dealing with diet BS at New Year's. I am Reagan Chastain, pronouns are she, her. Uh, Reagan at Sized for Success is my email. Um, also dances with that if you have that one. If you have, I'm going to leave plenty of time for Q&A, but if you have a question that like comes to you two weeks after this, please feel free to email me anytime. I live to talk about this stuff. Um, so for some pre-stuff, format-wise, some of you have heard this before, but my live presentation style is incredibly upbeat and energetic. And it turns out that comes across Zoom like I'm basically screaming at people in their living rooms, which people did not enjoy. And so this will be a much more sort of laid-back presentation than what it, we might see if we were together and I was on stage. Um, also, I'm about five weeks after a uh, open laparotomy and small bowel resection. And so I'm going to be more wiggly than I normally would be just to try to like maintain comfort while doing this. Um, again, we talked about the Q&A plenty of time. Uh, you'll be able to come off mute or ask in the chat or ask me privately in the chat or ask me later. Answer all the questions is like a primary concern of mine. I also always want to start by talking about privilege. So privilege is opportunities and treatment that we receive and difficulties, difficulties and barriers that we don't face if we live in a dominant identity rather than a marginalized identity. So for example, I experience a lot of privilege as a white person, as a cisgendered person, as a currently uh, neurotypical and uh, uh, able-bodied person, um, and a lot of other planes as well. And then I experienced marginalization as a fat person, as a queer person, and as a woman in a patriarchal society. So uh, one of the things about privilege uh, that makes things more difficult is that it puts us in a place where we don't know what we don't know because we're not having the experiences of people who have marginalized identities different than ours. And so it's our responsibility to know. So we have to reach out, we have to learn, we have to listen, not only to what experiences people are having, but to how they want us to use our privilege uh, to help them reach their goals. And I do try to do that. It's something that's really important to me. And also I mess up and I, you know, do things wrong. And so I am always completely open to being called in or out on those mistakes. So just to start us off that way. So quick word about language. Um, I use fat. I use it a lot for a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, it's a perfectly good adjective that people have been allowed to sort of heap negative beliefs onto. Um, it's a reclaiming term for me. It kind of lets my bullies know that they can't have my lunch money anymore. And it doesn't pathologize or medicalize my body the way that terms like, for example, obese and overweight do. Now, these are terms that were literally made up to pathologize larger bodies. Um, and they are deeply and inextricably rooted in racism and anti 
Blackness and highly recommend Sabrina Strings Fearing the Black Body and Deshaun Harrison's Belly of the Beast to learn more about that um, and the ways that not only are they rooted in racism and anti-Blackness, but they are why weight stigma continues to have a higher impact on BIPOC folks. Uh, they're also considered sort of medical or sciencey, but in, in truth, like the word obese just comes from the Latin word that means to eat until fat. And so because they've been put into our medical system and medicalized, it makes them sound more official, but they're really just made up terms that were created literally to pathologize and to medicalize higher weight bodies. The impact has been tremendous profit to the weight loss industry, uh, tremendous stigma and oppression to people in these classifications, and again, more uh, stigma and oppression for those at the highest weights and for those with multiple marginalized identities, and then fractured relationships between higher weight patients and healthcare practitioners, etc. Person first language is something I want to talk about because we're seeing it a lot in uh, diet ads from pharmaceutical companies and it's where they say, oh, you're not an obese person. You're a person with obesity or a person with overweight, which like, I feel like that phobia gives me enough problems without becoming grammatically problematic as well. But besides that, this is they say that it's about anti-stigma, but it's actually about profit. So this idea of person-first language was co-opted from disability community where it is quite controversial. And so I recommend reading folks' perspectives on that who are part of disability community. Uh, and so it was co-opted without any of that nuance uh, by companies that sell dangerous and expensive uh, quote unquote, weight loss treatments. And so in order to sell more treatments and to get covered insurance, just simply living in a fat body has to be seen as a, an illness in itself. And so by separating people from their body size, they position it in that way. So this is not truly anti-stigma languaging language. And in fact, it's actually more stigmatizing because we are separating people from their bodies. It would be like, you know, in my life, no one's ever said, oh, you're not a brunette. You just have brown hair. You know what I mean? So it's, it can be pretty transparent once you see it, but they're selling it hard as if it's an anti-stigma movement. And then the last thing is like fat isn't always the right word for everybody in every situation. So higher weight, people of size, larger bodies, you'll hear me use all of those. Uh, but when it comes to diet ads, it's under, it's important to understand like where the language comes from and how it affects and impacts folks. So if you're feeling a lot of pressure around uh, this idea of weight loss right now, that would not be a surprise because this is part of the diet industry trifecta of evil. So they push diets all the time, but during the year, there are three big times. There's the holidays are coming, right? Swimsuit season is coming, New Year's resolution season, and it's just like this constant uh, cycle that they put us through. Um, and so some examples, this was in a child's uh, section of a department store, and it says, Dear Santa, this year, please give me a big fat bank account and a slim body. Please don't mix those two up like you did last year like two children. This was a, a New Year's diet, you know, ad that put out, but wait, she's stock y'all. She's also advertising this, which offers 10 times less weight loss than the other ad. Um, but these are the kind of things we see, New Year, New You. Um, this was actually a, an advertisement for weight loss surgery, which we'll talk about a little bit. So the diet industry really capitalizes on this time of year, and it adds into this constant cycle of disempowerment that they've got going, wherein the diet and beauty industries tell us what's good and beautiful. And again, these things are typically rooted in dominant identities, thin, white, cis, het, currently able-bodied, currently neurotypical, young, etc. And so they tell us what's good and beautiful. We internalize that message. And then what's critical for them is that we then enforce that standard on other people. And when we do that, we become unpaid marketing force for the diet and beauty industries. And then everybody gets disempowered, they make a ton of money, and then it starts again. And so that this is the cycle that they're trying to take a lot of advantage of in the new year. So all of this is to kind of say, if you have negative views about larger bodies, including yours, like that's not a galloping shock. People paid a lot of money to the best marketers in the world to create that situation. The good news is it does not have to be that way. We can extricate ourselves from this situation. We don't have to buy into this. So diet culture messages are ubiquitous, right? They're all over the place. It's uh, television ads. It's uh magazine covers, it's billboards, it's at the healthcare provider's office, they're all over the place. They're dangerous. 
Uh, they harm people in myriad ways, first of all, by creating weight stigma, by creating weight cycling, by creating inequalities, including healthcare inequalities, uh, by driving eating disorders and disordered eating, and they harm everyone. But again, the harm is not equal. So diet culture harms people of all sizes, but again, it does the most harm to the people at the highest weights and to people with multiple marginalized identities, including and especially through racism and anti-blackness. So Sabrina Strings, again from Fearing the Black Body, said the current anti-fat bias in the United States and in much of the West was not born in the medical field. Racial scientific literature since at least the 18th century has claimed that fatness was, quote, savage and, quote, black. And so, again, highly recommend this book, but understand while weight stigma has become med medicalized, it was rooted in, in uh, racism. So there's a lot of lies behind this idea of like new year, new you, or waiting for a new you to arrive. The first is this idea that there's like a thin person trapped inside you. And this is like saying like, oh, if you're really tall, there's a short person trapped inside you. Like that's not the reality. I'm not a thin person trapped inside a fat body, I'm a fat person. And if the diet industry can keep us from owning that and moving forward, you know, strongly and happily in those bodies, then it can keep us chasing that thinner person that supposedly resides within us. Then there's the idea that, you know, your life starts when you hit your goal weight. And this is something that's so, oh, you know, and I did, I used to make lists of things I was going to do, you know, when I was finally thin. And so this causes people to put their lives on hold, sometimes permanently. You know, I've heard from people who said, you know, my mom was 94 on her deathbed and she, you know, has always disagreed with my uh, Hayes approach and my fat liberation politics. But she, on her deathbed said, you know, I, she realized that she had spent her whole life trying to be thin and hadn't done the thing she wanted to do and that, you know, she was proud of me for choosing something different. And so that's both heartbreaking and, you know, a good reminder of what the diet industry can do if we just keep pursuing thinness. Because as we know, uh, almost every intentional weight loss attempt fails. And so it's simply not an ethical evidence-based intervention for literally anything. Um, there's also the fact that oppression is erasure. If people believe that the best way to move themselves from weight stigma and, you know, the impacts of that is to become a thin person, they're not, they're not fighting for fat liberation, right? They're simply trying to move themselves out of the oppressed group. And while I would never directly compare oppressions because they come from different places and they oppress and privilege differently, as someone who had been doing queer activism uh, for a long time and trans activism as a queer woman myself, I saw the parallel finally to my fat activism work, realizing I had never considered that it was reasonable to try to become straight to avoid homophobia. I had correctly understood that homophobia was the problem, not me existing with my queer ass. But I hadn't had that same realization for weight stigma. And so as long as we still believe that the reason for weight stigma is that we exist in fat bodies, then we are being erased and our voices aren't being raised in fat liberation. And this goes into that idea that, oh, you're not a fat person, you're like a temporarily inconvenienced thin person. So instead of fighting for like clothes in your size and seats that accommodate, like change your body to suit your oppressors and your life, you will be easier. And this isn't the last time we'll talk about this, but weight stigma is real and it does real impacts and we cannot self-love our way out of systemic oppression. And that is really important to understand. We can do work, we can do activism, we can, you know, work on our own relationships with our bodies. But in truth, we are still subject to systemic oppression. And so those things are real. And the choice is, do we fight the oppression or do we fight our bodies? Is kind of what the, the choice is at the end of the day. So we are asked in this idea of, you know, new year, new me, to sacrifice our present for a hypothetical future right? Be miserable now, sacrifice now, you know, keep trying. And the problem is that this present becomes our future because we know what happens is most people lose weight short term, gain it back long term. And so, and then are told we'll try again, which is also known as weight cycling, which has a lot of negative uh, health impacts, both physically and psychologically that are beyond the scope of this talk. But the point is we're constantly being asked with this new year, new year diet bullshit to sacrifice our present for a future without being told that future's not coming. 
And so that future becomes a present that was exactly the same as our past. And again, in that way, we spend our whole lives chasing something that we're never really uh, likely to get and sacrificing our present along the way. Um, and then the last idea is that uh, lack of access is valid, right? If fat people can be thin people, then fat people don't need to be accommodated, which is ridiculous on all fronts. Even if you believe that, like fat people need to sit down now not at a hypothetical future when they're thinner, right? So even if you believe that, it's not like fat people could become instantly thin. So, but the truth is people of all sizes exist and people of all sizes deserve full accommodation, full equality of experience. And, you know, the idea of this new year, new you says, well, since you can be a different person, don't ask to be accommodated in this body, change it. And that becomes like the constant undercurrent. Like you could solve the stigma you experience by moving yourself out of the oppressed group. And that's one, a lie. You're very unlikely to move yourself out of the oppressed group, but beyond which you shouldn't have to, even if all fat people could become thin, there should still be full accommodation and equality of experience for people of all sizes, period. Fat people have the right to exist in fat bodies without shame, stigma, bullying, or oppression. It doesn't matter why we're fat. It doesn't matter if there are health impacts of being fat. It doesn't matter if we could or even want to become thin. The rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are not and should not be size dependent, period. So the framework that I'm going to talk about for the rest of this, I actually developed, I've been giving talks to healthcare practitioners since now 2009, which now seems like a long time. And uh, I talk about all the evidence around weight loss. And so even if they're like, okay, yeah, I, I see that, they're like, but my patients still want to lose weight. And I'm like, well, your patients probably also want to fly, but that doesn't justify telling them to like jump off the garage and flap their arms really hard. Cause like it probably won't work, but how cool would it be if it did, right? So we have to be talking about what's ethical and what's evidence-based and what's possible. And so I was, you know, my idea for them is ask, what are they trying to accomplish? And so when people at the new year, or anytime they are thinking about starting a diet are usually trying to improve or change one of three things. The first is health whether it's a health condition they have or it's something they're trying to prevent, uh, mobility or ability or chronic pain or escaping from weight stigma. And so what I thought I'd do with the rest of our time today is give some options around these things. Now, none of these things are obligations, are barometers of worthiness, are entirely within our control. All of these concepts, health, fitness, ability, mobility, these are sort of amorphous, gooey concepts. And so especially in our culture, we like to think that you could sort of throw a dart and hit like health or like easily define it, but that's simply not the case. So what I'm, my goal here is to give some different options if this is something that you are wanting to pursue or for those who would think that they would need weight loss to pursue these things. So we'll start with health. So this is how I originally got into this work. I did a literature review of all the research around weight and health because I had been yo-yo dieting for years and I was like, well, my background is in research methods and statistics and I've never even looked at the research around this. So I was going to do all the research to find like the best diet, the one that worked the most. And what I found is summarized in this quote that I will read. There isn't even one peer-reviewed controlled clinical study of any intentional weight loss diet that proves that people can be successful at long-term significant weight loss. No commercial program, clinical program, or research model has been able to demonstrate significant long-term weight loss for more than a small fraction of the participants. Given the potential dangers of weight cycling and repeated failure, it is unscientific and unethical to support the continued use of dieting as an intervention for quote-unquote obesity. Um, now, I would argue we don't need an intervention for fatness. We need to support fat people in their goals and the bodies that they have. But it's, I keep saying this and I'm going through this section because it is really easy to forget this because the diet industry is not super attached to telling the truth as a value. And that's in their commercials and that's in their research. You know, those of you who read the, the weight and healthcare substack, like I break down a lot where the conclusion will say, you know, people can lose significant weight loss on this program. And then in truth, everybody lost less than 3% of their body weight and then gained it back. You know what I mean? So that is why I'm going to keep talking about this so that like this can stay in our heads when we see all these diets come in. So this is not like new information. 
1959, Stunkert et al. found that dieting fails roughly 95% of the time. 1992, the National Institutes for Health admitted the same thing. No matter what weight loss program people followed, almost all of them gained their weight back. Replicated in 99 by Miller, 2007 by Man and Tomiyama. In 2013, the Australian National Medical Health and Research Council put this out as A-level evidence. 2020, a Canadian expert panel on quote-unquote obesity. And 2021, Gazer and Angotti. So this isn't new. And sometimes people say, well, that's just one study from 1959 or, oh, it's just fad diets. But no, this is, uh, you know, since 1959 and it's looking at any kind of intentional weight loss method uh, that involves like manipulating food and movement to try to modify body size. And this is what we find fails almost all the time. The research actually finds that what happens is almost everyone loses weight short term. About 95% regain it long-term and up to 66% of people regain more than they lost. And there's nothing wrong with fat or being fatter. There is something deeply wrong with something considered a medical intervention that has the opposite of the intended effect the majority of the time. So how we got fooled by this is that the weight loss industry knew this early. So like Weight Watchers, if you go and look at their original incorporation documents, it literally is based on a repeat business model. And what they have done brilliantly is understand that there's this biological response to intentional weight loss methods where people lose weight short term and gain the weight back long term. And they take credit for the first part where people lose the weight and then they blame people and get us to blame ourselves and others for the second part of that same biological response and then say, well, you didn't try hard enough, but come back and try again. And so that got, you know, not just into the weight loss industry, but into the medical industry and healthcare, and they inserted themselves in committees and they inserted themselves into the research. And so when you start really peeling this apart, you kind of start sounding like, like maybe a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist a little bit, because it is in fact a conspiracy. And it's been incredibly profitable. The diet industry makes about $70 billion a year up from about 20 billion in 2012. And you couldn't make that kind of exponential growth without, you know, uh, with a product that worked. Right? If their product worked, they wouldn't continue to grow since 1930. But here we are. So weight loss surgeries, I'm seeing a lot of advertisements for those. So I want to talk about that briefly. What it is, we take a healthy, correctly functioning organ, stomach, or digestive system, surgically mutilate it to put it into a disease state in order to force behaviors that mimic eating disorders. That is what those surgeries are at their base. That's the process. Possible outcomes. Some people are happy. Uh, often people are happy for about two years and then we start to see more side effects and a decline in satisfaction. And that is why most studies of happiness end at two years. Uh, but some people, even if they have horrible side effects, are still happy. I talked to somebody who's had seven emergency surgeries after her initial surgery and she said, but you know, it's so great because I can shop in quote unquote normal clothing stores. And so in terms of individual decisions around this surgery, again, it's seen as a way not just to, you know, lose weight or be healthier, but to literally move yourself out of an oppressed group. So you wonder, would people risk their life and quality of life if they had clothing available in their size? Uh, as just one example, right? So then there's a second group. These folks are miserable. They have horrible lifelong side effects. They would give anything to take the surgery back. And typically they're not tracked in studies because they often stop going to follow up because of shame and blame. And because they are blamed by the industry for their outcome, even though this is an extremely common and predictable outcome of the surgery. And uh, this includes health impacts, depression, suicidality, alcohol abuse, self-blame, weight regain. And this happens particularly after that one to two year honeymoon period. And then there are people who are deceased, and that might be on the table or short-term or long-term side effects. Uh, but those are heartbreaking stories and, again, are typically not tracked or reported. And these surgeries are sold in, like, glorified Amway rallies where they only hear from people who are in that honeymoon stage. And you never hear from somebody who says, I would give anything to take this back. And you never hear from the friends and family of the people who passed away. Um, and the underlying belief of these surgeries is that fat people should be willing to risk their lives and quality of life in an attempt to become thinner and to cure or prevent health problems that happen to thin people from whom those risks are not asked, right? So a fat person who is, uh, you know, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes may be referred to this surgery, whereas a thin person with the same symptoms, diagnosis, A1C, et cetera, would be given ethical evidence-based interventions that don't risk their life and quality of life. 
Um, and so what is the alternative? This is, I know this is supposed to be fun, so I don't mean to be Debbie Downer, but I do want to talk about these things because this is what we are up against at this barrage of ads and uh, healthcare practitioner discussions that come at us during this time of year. So Matheson et al. looked at healthy lifestyle habits, 11,761 cis men and women, and their, uh, the habits were eating five or more servings of fruits and vegetables, exercising more than 12 times a month, alcohol up to one drink a day for cis women, two drinks for cis men, and not smoking. I do want to say that in this study, as in almost all studies, there is no trans or non-binary representation, and that is a tragedy and an unacceptable situation that needs to be fixed yesterday. Um, and there's also an underrepresentation of people of color, same thing, unacceptable in the research and incredibly common. So if we look at this graph here, what we've got on the y-axis, we've got health hazard ratio, x-axis, number of healthy habits. And so in each, over each of the numbers of healthy habits, one through four, we have the weight categories. And these are the categories they use. Again, these are not terms that I would use in any context, but they've got quote unquote normal weight, quote unquote overweight, quote unquote obese. And what we can see is for those practicing zero habits, there is a difference between the body sizes. Now, what we can't say is that is causal because these folks may be being subjected to more weight stigma, more weight cycling, uh, more healthcare inequalities. But we see that there is a difference when people are practicing one of the habits, that difference compacts. And by the time they get to four, the health hazard ratios are basically the same regardless of size. Huh. Interesting. Thanks, whoever's talking right now. Um, sorry, I can't see. I can't see you if you are talking. But hi. Um, anyway, so we've got this this situation, and the reason I'm pointing this out is because dieting, in addition to not succeeding at making you thinner does not succeed at making people healthier. And so if you're looking at an ethical evidence-based way to support your body, understanding again, not an obligation, not a barometer of worthiness, not entirely within our control, behaviors are a much more uh, ethical way to go, much more evidence-based way to go. And Gazer and Angotti came out just in 2021 in September, and it was a uh, study that looked at physical activity and health. And again, it uses the terms, quote unquote, overweight and obese, and those are not terms I would use in any other uh, stance, but they, it was a huge study. It analyzed 225 studies, systematic reviews, and meta-analyses, huge data set. And they found that the mortality risk that gets associated with, quote unquote, obesity is largely attenuated or eliminated by moderate to high levels of cardiorespiratory fitness or physical activity that weight loss, even if intentional, is not consistently associated with lower mortality risk. That weight cycling is associated with numerous adverse health outcomes, including increased mortality. And this is a really frustrating thing to me because most studies that look at health outcomes of higher weight people don't control for or even discuss weight stigma or weight cycling or healthcare inequalities, even though these are massively confounding variables. Uh, and then they found that increases in cardiorespiratory fitness and physical activity are consistently associated with greater reductions in mortality risk than is intentional weight loss. And that adherence could improve if healthcare professionals would talk about the benefits and absence of weight loss. Because what happens is for those who want to consider movement as an option, and again, completely an option, uh, it gets linked to weight loss. And so they think if I'm doing this and I'm not losing weight, then I'm not having any benefit. And so that lie about weight loss interferes with people's relationships with movement and their bodies in ways that are really dangerous. So what we would look for here is a change in focus. So instead of focusing on manipulating our size, focusing on supporting our bodies based on our own priorities and situations, because this is going to be different for somebody living with a chronic illness. This is going to be different for somebody living with multiple disabilities, multiple marginalized identities, different based on socioeconomic status. And so it's not about defining health and then judging everybody by that standard. It's about each person choosing their own priorities and definitions and path based on their own situation. And for those who want to work on increasing public health, it's about bringing down barriers to access, which includes oppression. It's about increasing uh, options for access, and it's about making everyone welcome. So like I do a lot of work in the fitness world, um, and there's a, a privilege that comes along with that kind of a good fatty privilege that is bullshit, and then I want to help kill, kill, kill. Uh, but so when I talk about fitness, I talk about like nobody's obligated to participate, but everybody should be welcome. And so 
you know, there's this idea of people should just be willing to go into unsafe, unhappy situations to support their health. And that's not accurate at all. So it's about like deciding what we want to do and then finding ways to be safe doing it. So if people are trying weight loss for mobility or disability or chronic pain, so weight stigma tells us, first of all, to blame our bodies for disabilities, for mobility challenges, for chronic pain. But in truth, there are people of all sizes on every point of the ability and mobility and pain spectrum. And so being thin can neither be a sure preventative nor a sure cure. Fat folks with disabilities, mobility challenges, and chronic pain get harmed at the intersections of fat phobia and ableism and healthism. So each of those do their own uh, oppressing, and then at the intersections of them is additional oppression. And that's using a framework created by uh, scholar Kimberly Crenshaw of intersectionality. And so again, weight loss does not meet the criteria of an ethical evidence-based intervention for anything. So weight loss is simply not an appropriate prescription. And because we get lied to about that and because we, you know, may want to address the situation that we're in, we consider weight loss to be a reasonable thing. And it's really, really not. So what is the options? Well, a first option is for assist assistive devices, um, medications, and so that may include like mobility aids or self-care aids or medication. These can provide more immediate help and solutions. They can be temporary or permanent, uh, but access can be an issue. They're often expensive. They're often difficult to get. And for folks who have able-bodied privilege, there's often a lack of awareness of how difficult it is to actually get these things. There is kind of a sense that if somebody has a disability, becomes disabled, suddenly like what they need is available and that is absolutely not the way our system works especially you know here in the states and then ableism including internalized ableism can be a barrier and i see this with healthcare practitioners where they have this idea that they don't want people to become quote unquote dependent on mobility aids they want them to like you know work on something else perhaps weight loss to solve the problem quote unquote and so they basically what they're saying is i prefer that my patient be in pain and have limited mobility and function rather than simply be given a device that could help them right and sometimes it's about internalized ableism where and this is real again ableism is real it impacts people severely and so people do have a different experience if they use a mobility aid that is uh viewable to the public and so these aren't like unfounded fears but it can create a situation where someone who could be helped immediately by you know a mobility aid a self-care aid a medication um then either doesn't have access to it or is uncomfortable about accessing it. And this can be everything from like a scooter or a walker to like a, an aid to help wipe if someone's struggling with reaching to wipe. And so first of all, knowing that these things exist can be difficult because there's no real centralized database. And if you're counting on a healthcare practitioner, they may not know. And then again, you're facing barriers of access and ableism. And I always want to be clear about that. But that first, you know, uh, option can be finding something to help immediately with whatever the goals and priorities of the person are. And then if people want longer term therapy, you know, folks of all sizes can work to increase strength and stamina and flexibility and balance. Um, and then there are treatment options, surgery, medication, physical and occupational therapy, and all of these options should be available to patients of all sizes. And unfortunately, they aren't necessarily available to patients of all sizes because of weight stigma, because of uh, the combinations of weight, weight stigma and racism and more. So, but when we're talking about if, you know, we're wanting to address mobility issues or a disability or chronic illness, we can look at what is available and we can see what we can get access to and remember that weight loss is simply not an ethical evidence-based intervention for those things. And then the last reason that people often talk about wanting to um, lose weight is to escape from weight stigma. So again, weight stigma is a reality. It's not in our heads. It's real and it harms us. It does more harm to those at higher weights, more harm to those with multiple marginalized identities, and it can impact everything from relationships to career to healthcare access to access to the world. Um, and so this is a real thing. And so becoming thinner, again, also means moving ourselves out of an oppressed class. That's real. 
those who become thinner move themselves out of an oppressed class, at least temporarily. Now, what will happen is most of those folks will gain their weight back and end up back in the oppressed class with the physical and psychological harm that weight cycling creates. But it's very tempting, and the diet industry knows just how to sort of dangle that carrot that, look, your life would be materially better if you were a thinner person. And again, we cannot love ourselves out of systemic oppression. And so it's a situation where, again, I try to give folks as many tools as possible to live in a world where weight stigma is rampant and to find ways to survive and thrive. And But I always want to be clear, we shouldn't have to do this. Like most of the talks that are happening today shouldn't be, we should be talking about other fun things. Um, I often say that I have a dream job that I wish didn't exist, which is to say that in the world that we live in, this is what I want to be doing, but I wish I didn't need to do it and I could just like go be a you know mediocre stand-up comic somewhere but like this is the world that we live in and we cannot there we can't love ourselves out of systemic oppression we can't always you know even use tools and strategies to fix systemic oppression and the oppression we experience is never our fault unfortunately often it becomes our problem but it's really helpful and important to separate those two things. We didn't cause this problem. We are simply experiencing the effects of weight stigma that should not be happening. So for me, uh, as I got to have greater understanding around this, I realized basically that I had this choice, um, that I could fight my body on behalf of weight stigma. And I had done that for years and years, right? I wanted, on behalf of my oppressors, I wanted to change myself to suit them as, you know, the quote unquote solution to my problems. And instead of fighting my body on behalf of weight stigma, I decided to fight weight stigma on behalf of my body. And it is the best decision that I have ever made. Um, it's, you know, it gave me clarity about the world. It allowed me to realize like my body is not and never was the problem. And I never needed a new me in the new year. I needed the same me. The world needed more me, more of all of us, like more being present, more loving our bodies, more uh, insisting on equality, more voices. And what this new year, new me thing does is say, Welcome to the new year. Work as hard as you can to be less. And that is incredibly profitable for the diet industry and is incredibly harmful to us. And we do not have to buy into that paradigm. So recognizing fat phobia, especially internalized fat phobia, can be tricky. So it kind of sounds like, well, fat people shouldn't be accommodated. And I made this mistake. Like I used to say, I don't know why fat people think they should get two seats for free on the airplane. Like it's like the U.S. Postal Service. If it fits, it ships. And that was wrong. Dead wrong. Pure wrong. So it's... In truth, like they knew fat people existed when they made those plane seats and they purposely excluded us and now they've made it our problem to pay twice as much for the same thing that the person next to us is getting, which is travel from city to city in a seat that accommodates them. It can also sound like, well, fat people should pay more, right? When we start talking about equality of clothing sizes and prices, the number of people who become absolute experts at economics and bolt sizes and cutting table sizes is extraordinary. And my point is, I do not care, right? We have to figure out how to make these items equitably priced. And there are companies already doing it. Mallory Dunn, Smart Glamour, already doing it. This is possible. And so what internalized fat phobia can look like is justifying our own oppression on behalf of our oppressors. And again, something I have done many times fallen into that trap. It can look like fat people should try to accommodate fat phobia, right? It's not somebody else's fault that you take up the whole plane seat. So you should absolutely like curl yourself up and wrap yourself in a cocoon if like whatever it takes to not touch the person next to you or that fat people are to blame or that inequality is reasonable. You know, I this happens sometimes with healthcare providers when I'm talking about MRI access. And they're like, well, what do you want? Like an MRI that like fits a person who weighs X number of pounds that they think is a lot. And I'm like, yes, good. Yes. You're coming right along with me. I appreciate that. We're on the same page. That is exactly what I want. Um, and then there's the idea fat people shouldn't. And this can be anything from like fat people shouldn't expect equality. Like you shouldn't think that you can go into a restaurant and they'll have a seat that fits you or, you know, 
fat people shouldn't wear that. And this is, this can be blatant fat phobia or it can be things that we have uh, internalized. And so as we, you know, in the new year, new me idea, what I want to do is uncover those things in myself, right? Because it's really easy to shop at Shipmart, y'all. It's really easy because it's open 24 hours and it's delivered right to our door. And so it's really easy to buy into those things and not even realize it. And then, so when we find that, when we realize that, a lot of times we can have shame around it. And in truth, like that is an exciting moment because we can't work to fix what we don't know we're dealing with. So when we're like, oh no, I do believe that. Or, and oh, that is, she's saying that's fat phobic. Let me think about that. Like that's a really cool moment because that's a moment that we can extricate ourselves a little more from the fat phobia that's been like spoon fed to us since we were kids. We can start to dismantle this by asking questions about our oppression, right? Where did I get this idea? Who profits from this idea? This was a really helpful one to me because I work best uh, in rage when I'm dismantling these things and realizing like how many people got rich on my internalized oppression was really helpful to get me to like pull back. Are these ideas serving me? You know, has this ever helped me? Is this helping other people? Is this likely to help me? And then creating like a return to sender slogan. Um, like I've been shopping at Shipmart again, it's time to make some returns or never again, or nope, nope, nope. My personal slogan is, hey, that's bullshit. And I spent several months early in my journey thinking that like consciously every time I saw a negative message about body size. And over that period of months, and this sounds like an absolutely hokey thing to do, and it probably is a hokey thing to do, but what I realized was that it really fundamentally changed my relationship with these messages. And then it became like an exoskeleton. And so now when I'm like driving down the highway and there's like a freeze your fat, you know, billboard, it just bounces off the, hey, that's bullshit exoskeleton without ever being allowed in. And then I don't have to kick it back out. And so this exercise has been incredibly helpful to me in terms of like dealing because it's constant. Um, one of the like the blog posts that got my blog, my blog was being read by like six people, including my mom. And then I wrote this post about, I took in 24 hours, the number of negative body messages I, about myself that I received and unscientifically extrapolated that to a year, right? This is not a scientific study, but it was like over 360,000 negative things that I would experience if that 24 hours was a good sample. And so this is constant and it sucks because this work is never undone or never done rather. It's like laundry. Right. So you, you get done with the laundry and then, you know, something comes in and you're like, oh, maybe this diet would work. Oh, dang it. And then you have to like do that laundry again. So having the tools to do this consistently, I think is really helpful. Um, and then body gratitude. This was the first, first thing I ever did on my journey to getting good with my body was I just wrote down a list of all the things my body could do. And I got super granular, like breathing, blinking, heartbeat, waste management. Um, and then every time I tried to become really conscious of my thoughts and when I would have a negative thought about my body, I would replace it with something from the list, literally anything. Cause I struggled, like it felt disingenuous to be like, oh, I hate this part of it. Like, no, I love it. Uh, that didn't work for me personally. It works for others and that's super cool. Uh, but for me saying, oh, I hate this part of it. Like, wait, Thank you for breathing. Like you're killing it with circulation. Really appreciate that. Like, thanks for peeing. Need that to happen. And again, it sounds super hokey, but it, after a period of, I would say three to four months, it fundamentally changed my relationship with my body uh, because it let me see my body as a partner and that my body had been doing all of this stuff for me. And I had spent so much time hating my body for not looking like a Photoshop picture of someone else that I hadn't had a second's worth of gratitude for everything it did. And I wanna be clear, this process can be complicated for those who are dealing with chronic illness and disability. And so um, with that, and we'll talk a little bit about it in a, in a minute, but for me, I found that thinking of it as being me and my body dealing with a situation rather than me against my body was helpful. Um, and we'll talk about that again, like I said, in a second. But the other thing that helped me a lot was thinking about the ability to see beauty as a skill set. And there are a lot of different ways to dismantle beauty and the power it has in our culture, and all of them are valid. For me, this was really helpful because if I say, all right, the ability to see beauty is a skill set, and most people do not develop it beyond that stereotype that's based in thin, white, cis, het, you know, currently able-bodied and uh, young. 
And so that's what they've got for their skill set. And so anything outside of that, they're like, I cannot see beauty in that. And that is 100% their responsibility. So if someone can't see the beauty in me, it's not that it's not there, it's that they have failed to develop their skill set to see it. And similarly, if I can't see the beauty in someone else, that's be not because it's not there, that's because of my skill set. And that's something that I can work to develop. But conceptualizing it that way helped me to stop thinking that I should change myself to fit somebody else's extremely limited skill set in perceiving beauty. And so again, when these things happen, and this, for me, this happened uh, when I injured my neck and I was in extreme chronic pain and I lost the use of my right arm for a while and they weren't sure if it was coming back. And I had had a tremendous amount of able-bodied privilege to that moment. And so this was really the first time that I was like, hey body, do a thing. And my body was like, eh, nah. And so it really like messed up my relationship with my body. And I see this happen also to people who get diagnoses, like they're chugging along on their size acceptance and weight neutral health at every size journey. And then bam, they get a health diagnosis. And then it's like, well, I guess that's over. The weight loss is like the thing. And again, weight loss is not an ethical evidence-based intervention for any health issue or for anything at all, but it's easy to have that trip us up. And so to me, it's like, okay, this isn't, I can't conceptualize this as me against my body. Like that's not helping me to be mad at my body. It's reasonable, but it's not helping me. So it helped me to say, all right, this is me and my body dealing with this issue. And like, what are we going to do? And how can we, how can I make decisions for both of us? And so, um, if that's a framework that's helpful for you, I highly wel you know, welcome you obviously to hang on to it. If it's not, then that's okay too. There's a lot of different valid ways to deal with these things. So in terms of opting out, we can start with our own mouths when it comes to negative body talk. And this can often be a really good starting point. So we can refuse to engage. I have a friend who memorized a bunch of monkey facts. And when somebody says something like negative body talk or diet talk, she legit just says a monkey fact. And that is a conversation chain. Like, hey, did you know that silverback monkeys throw these monkeys as weapons? And like, wait, what? And then that, now the whole conversation's talking about something else. Um, we can just walk away, right? Hey, look, bunt cake and be gone. Um, we can say something and it doesn't have to be like, what you just said is not cool. No, it can be. It's often what I do. Uh, but it can also be just general, like, I, live, I wish we lived in a world where we could just celebrate people of all sizes. Or I, lived in, I wish we lived in a world that didn't encourage us to hate our bodies and to talk about other people's bodies. Um, and, you know, don't give a click. Yeah. Uh, if we don't click on the, if nobody clicked on the better and worse bikini bodies articles, they would stop publishing them. And even <laughs> if our not clicking on them doesn't stop them from publishing them, it stops us from seeing them, which is a great intermediate step. So, you know, choosing what we consume online, how we give our attention and eyeballs and clicks is an important part of our own work and can be an important part of world changing work. And then like and follow. So there, there was 386,170 unhelpful things that I found in that blog. Um, social media, art, slideshow, follow people who feed you. Follow people who show bodies like yours in a positive way. Create that experience for yourself. Curate your social media to see that. Report those diet posts. I'm right now in this thing where like, do I want to report this diet ad as misleading and a scam? Or do I want to like, put a comment and a link to an article on it. Like, so those are the kind of two ways that I deal with it. Um, but create that world for yourself. And then in terms of dealing with the past trauma, identify who or what hurt you and put that problem where it belongs. It wasn't you. It was them. It was weight stigma. It was that your junior high, high school gym teacher was an <laughs> asshole. Like these are, the problem was not you. You might reenact it, um, and this is something that I find uh, really helpful after, like sometimes we, because of a power differential, privilege differential, et cetera, can't speak up or we don't want to in a moment. So if you get in the car and you just like play that out loud, it can be, give incredible closure and empowerment. Um, write a letter and send it or not. Seek support um, from peers, from professionals, and set boundaries in the present. You know, it's okay to say, look, I want to hang out with you, but it's not okay to talk about my weight anymore. And then the consequence, if you do talk about my weight, I'm going to go ahead and leave and we can try again next time and then follow through. And um, it doesn't have to be a big consequence. It just has to be something you can follow through with. And in my experience and the experience of a lot of people that I coach with this, it really only took one time. Now your mileage may vary, but we're allowed to set boundaries. Like you have to be this respectful to ride this <laughs> ride. 
And then more steps, thinking of the body as a friend, for better or worse. I have a friend who married herself and got like a, a tattooed wedding ring where she was like uh, dealing with a lot of chronic health issues that were going to be, you know, progressive. And she was like, I really want to commit to my body however it shows up every single day for the rest of my life. Um, separating weight and health. There's no such thing as a healthy weight. There's no weight that you won't get a health issue and you'll only die if you get hit by a bus. That's not a real thing. Um, separate health and value and self-worth. These are not the same. You are valid and worthy at any size, at any ability, at any health. Um, notice who's selling what you're buying. Again, create that return to sender slogan. And my thing was, I was like waiting for a thin body to show up. And I decided that instead of doing that, I was just going to take my fat body out for a spin and see how that went. And that decision changed my life. So we are at the Q&A. Um, hey. so if you Again, if you don't want to ask a question in front of the group, if it comes to you in two weeks or two years or whatever, you can email me, you can message me. Here are some places you can find me. Um, and I will leave that up for a second if folks want to screenshot and then open it up, Crystal, to questions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. One question that somebody sent in through the, the form anonymously, and I'll read it. Because, um, um, not only are there ads coming fast and furious, but I've regained some weight lately to the point that I need to buy new clothes. I'm trying to unlearn my internalized fat phobia, especially since I tend to cope with anxiety by, uh, sorry, I got, well, it got cut off. Oh no, I can't read it. By, anyway, she's gained weight. She has, I'm not sure it's a woman actually, but this person's gained weight. They have to buy more clothes. They're trying really hard to get rid of their internalized fat phobia. And they know that she wants to be happy. They want to be uh, happy with their body in any weight. She, they know intentionally why their size doesn't matter and that health. Oh, I lost you. For health or bullshit is beauty standards that I can't. Most helpful way to get rid of the negative body images issues and especially this time of year. So it sounds like they just can't really, they know all the things intellectually, but they just can't really get it. In their, in their own head, their own brain. Yeah, it's it's two different things, right? Like you can intellectually know, but then how we actually feel is different and it's a process of uncovering. Um, so to me, I look at my body size as like a division of responsibility. Like I'm responsible for like how I use the body. My body is responsible for what size it ends up being. And so if I take manipulating my body size off the table, then like what else is there? And so when you're at a place where you're intellectually there, but not all the way there, like within your body, I think that can be a first step, right? Mm -hmm. Weight loss is not an option. What are the other options? And um, how can I look at this change in a way that I can embrace it a little bit? So if you're at a place where like financially getting additional um, clothes isn't going to be an issue, then cool, I get to pick new clothes, can be a thing. Let's learn about some very cool designers and highly recommend Saucy West's, uh, Saucy West's Fight for Inclusivity, S-A-U-C-Y-E West on Instagram. Um, she has done an incredible job of putting together a list of companies to support and a list of companies that are not truly size inclusive, including for super fat. So uh, just throw that out there. But um, in, in general, then it's, again, a process of uncovering, right? What about this situation am I unhappy with? And am I unhappy because I'm get, I'm having to lose some of my favorite clothes, which is legit, right? Like that sucks. And what could I do? Like, could I have some of them tailored? Are there options? Um, could I get them in a new size? And then, you know, could I look at this as a, as a fun journey? Am I upset because I need new clothes and I can't afford them? Legitimate. And so like, what can I do? I could, can I look at like fat too and see if there's less expensive? Can I look at, you know, clothing swaps and that kind of thing uh, to solve that issue when it's COVID safe, of course. Um, and then looking at, or am I sad that I'm bigger in a world that tells me being bigger is a bad thing and where being bigger does have actual like consequences due to oppression. And okay, understanding that, like, what am I going to do? And for me, that solution is always activism. Like that is activism is like a huge self-care practice for me because it's like I see what's messed up in the world and I push back against it. For other folks, it might be different kinds of self-care. It might be going to a group, whether it's like a Facebook group or a therapy group or a professional to really like talk about your feelings around that and figure out a way that you can be upset about the oppression 
um, without internalizing that to your body. Um, and it's, again, it's just a practice. So some of this will also just come over time. And it's a practice that like laundry starts again, right? So we're doing good and then something happens. We need a larger clothing size. We get a health diagnosis. We go to a theme park and can't fit on a ride. And it, like our whole lives, we've been told to blame and shame ourselves for that. And so it's not surprising if that's our first reaction. And so when we get faster at recognizing that and at turning that back out, that can really like, again, create that kind of exoskeleton and create that situation where we're staying in our core of like, the world is messed up, legitimately messed up. I am fine. It's not my fault. It's become my problem. And really just continuing to do the work and accepting that it's a process over time, I think can be a really helpful thing too. Absolutely. Um, in the comments, I saw some comments from Deb and Tigris. So maybe the two of them would like to speak. Or, and also, and we can ask questions if anybody who wants to have, ask a question, they're welcome to. Tigris generous, generously offered to um, start a little bit later if we have a lot of questions. So um, Deb, can you unmute yourself or should I unmute you? Let's see. Hi. Oh, there you are. Hi, Deb. This Deb, right? You mean yes. me? <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. um, Deb. <laughs> um, basically, I've been thinking about the audience for this, Reagan, and I realized that you sort of, um, you probably have several talks in here, and um, one of the talks is to the healthcare providers about why you shouldn't prescribe weight loss. <laughs> um, and another one is to people who are fat. And you're really trying to address some of the you know, internalized um, ideas of, that have harmed us. And I see that kind of throughout what you're doing. And I think I've, I've wanting, I'm sort of wanting to complicate this a little bit because in the last few years, um, my own privilege at this being a choice for me um, has, it's become clear that there, there are people for whom this is much less of a choice. And I particularly thought it would be good to make sure that we're addressing the, the sort of growing and growing and growing truth that, um, from abortion to uh, transplanted organ to knee 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 a new knee replacement or um, you know just a zillion 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 um, examples in the clinical guidelines for healthcare providers they're basically living by treat the weight first and they will withhold. Uh, blood pressure medication. They'll withhold medication for diabetes. They'll withhold the same treatments that somebody thinner would get. And, you know, if we have a choice, that's great. We say, we don't like this. We want to push back on this. And there's another doctor that I can choose from or whatever. And I just want to really think about the people who are desperately trying to get their medical care and they are just having to do this shit. And I just want them to know <laughs> you are in my heart. I don't think that this is something that you should have to be heroic all the time about because it's just the, it's the outcome of the harm. And so when I'm thinking so much about a harm reduction kind of approach to this and thinking, you know, in terms of that entity that you were talking about, Reagan, you know, like, how do you hold this in yourself with your body <laughs> and thinking about, you know, um, you know, trying to do something as lovingly as possible with what you have to work with, you know, as choices and trying to make that a harm reduction situation for ourselves, you know, as much as we can, because it's gonna, we aren't living in a universe where all of this is even possible. You know, and I just, I love the vision of it. And I think there's all this work to be done. I think there's a bunch of doctors that really want to do this work differently. I don't think they went into this profession for this, you know, and uh, it's all fucked up, you know. <laughs> so in the meantime, you know, trying to get our medical care is really important. And I, I just wanted to also um, um, 
notice that I think this is true for a lot of um, people who are trying to get their gender confirmation surgeries and uh, the trans community is trying to deal with this every which way, right? There's just a bunch of examples of people with um, so, many, so many fewer options, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah thank like you. you said too, it's a bigger, even a bigger problem for people on Medicaid because they don't, they already have oh. options. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. As always, 100% right. Deb, thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Deb. <laughs> Okay, also, oh, Tiger, do you have something you wanted to add? Can't remember what you wrote now. Um, I think my comments were just sharing resources. I shared the link okay. to Saucy's website for people who are not on Instagram. She keeps an updated list on there of the businesses that she's supporting in her boycott and the businesses that she's encouraging people to boycott in her boycott. So you can um, see that information at saucywestplusmodel.com. And I think that's all I put in the comments. Okay. Who else has a question? Pauline has her hands up also. Sure, go for it. Okay. Is it, can we unmute her? I don't see them. Pauline? Did you say Pauline? Yeah, okay. hi. There you go. Hi, hi Pauline. Um, I just, uh, I had a question for Reagan about uh, supporting someone who has bought into the, uh, the weight loss propaganda. My brother in this past year has lost a lot of weight and he lost it. He basically starved himself. It, and it wasn't really, it was only semi, it wasn't really intentional, but now he's, he says he's, I guess this is the honeymoon phase because he says he's happy with his, you know, being smaller sized. And when he went to the doctor, the doctor didn't um, the doctor said he didn't really approve of his methods, but he was happy with the results. And I was just like, what the, how, what? And I, I just, I, I don't know how to, and I, I'm worried what will, what will happen to him uh, if, if he does, if he is, you know, I mean, the chances are good that he'll gain the weight back and what will happen to him then and how, how he'll <laughs> feel. And I, I, I don't know how to break it to him that he's, you know, wasted all this time and starved himself for nothing. And it's like, how, how do you, how do you talk to someone who's, who's still mired in the, in the myth and the fat phobia? Yeah. So thanks for asking about this. And I'm so sorry that, you know, you and he are in this place. Um, it's a difficult thing, right? Because people have at least temporarily moved themselves out of an oppressed group. And so not surprising that they feel happy about that, especially when they're being affirmed by friends, family, randos on the internet, their healthcare providers. And so I tend to, people like this in my life, and I don't have a lot of them, but I tend to try to do an inoculation process. So like, for example, if I'm on my Facebook feed and somebody's like weight loss post comes up or before and after, I the comment is always basically the same, which is um, you look great in both pictures. Um, if like the vast majority of people, you end up regaining all of your weight, know that that's not your fault and you're valid and worthy at every size. And people do not necessarily appreciate this. And that's okay there with it. I take a pretty extreme view of not just social media autonomy, but like body autonomy. People are allowed to do what they want with their bodies to me. Um, but I am not obligated to support that or to provide resources to them to support that. And so they're welcome to block me. They're welcome to unfriend me, whatever. But that's what they're going to get every single time I see that. And it's because when they do gain the way back almost inevitably, I want them to have the chance to remember that one person said you're valid and worthy at every size because when they gain the weight back they're also gaining it back with the knowledge that everybody they know and randos on the internet liked them better when they were thin yep. and that is psychological mind fuck yep. and so i want there to be one voice and i hear from people i really do who are like hey i blocked you three years ago because you didn't support my weight loss journey and i gained it all back and you know i'm so and like so at least for some people they're hearing that and even if they don't like at least I put it out there in the world. And so to me, it's like that inoculation and that if I want that person in my life, but I'm not willing to support their weight loss and they want that from me, then at that point I have to set a boundary. Look, love to hang out with you, um, but this is something that 
if you want to hang out with me, we're not going to talk about. Like, we're not going to talk about weight loss. We're not going to talk about your diet, why you're eating, what you're eating, how, like, I don't care. Um, there are so many things. You, you don't have to say it like that. I probably might. But you could just say, like, there are so many other things to talk about. Like, this is just something that, you know, isn't cool for me to talk about. And if they can't respect that boundary, then you unfortunately have some decisions to make. But in terms of, like, talking to somebody who's in the weight loss phase, I, I just keep reinforcing, like, look, if, like, the vast majority of people, you gain your weight back, that's what the research said that would happen. It's not your fault. And you are valid and worthy and deserve love and care at every size. And I, I feel just, like I'm way over, by the way, Tigress. Thank you yeah, for giving me extra time, but I'm happy to stop at any time. We, we can do a few more questions. I was just going to say, uh, my best friend just told me that she's doing an altruistic kidney donation and they want her to lose 30. It's like, I don't want to hear about any more of this bullshit. Uh, first of all, I don't want her don donating her kidney because I think it's, wor it worries me. But um, I was like, I don't want to hear about all this diet shit. She goes, I know, I've been trying to figure out how to tell you. And I was like, yeah, you know, I don't want to hear. And it goes back to what Deb said, you know, sometimes that's what people have to do. Like gender confirmation surgeries are withheld yes. until people meet a BMI guideline. And so that is their physical and psychological well-being held ransom for weight loss. And what options do they have? The Mayo Clinic, I'm writing about this now. I'm just, I'm trying to get a quote from them and I can't. They have, if there's, there's a so liver, uh, a liver, liver, sorry, did you lose me? No, I think you're back. Okay. Um, the Mayo Clinic is doing this thing that I'm writing about, but I can't seem to get a quote from them, where they'll give you a liver transplant at a BMI that they consider unsafe, but only if you agree to have simultaneous weight loss surgery. Mm -hmm. And like the amount of fucked up it is to say, we're going to replace a diseased organ with a healthy organ. And then simultaneously, we're going to take your healthy organ and put it into a disease state. Congrats. That makes sure that you'll be undernourished for your recovery. Like you can't, you can only get to this by like jumping off the logic train before it hits the station. Like you can't get gymnastics. here through logic. Um, but yeah, so it's like, it goes back again to what Deborah Gar was saying about like, this is, people are held hostage. Their well being, their, their lives, their, you know, desires are held hostage for weight loss. And it's such a like messed up thing for them to have to go through, but also like, we're not obligated to support people trying intentional weight loss regardless of their reasons. It's up, you know, we can make those decisions and those make those boundaries for our own safety as well. Like it's completely reasonable if somebody says, I want to, you know, do this to get the surgery I want, but I can also say like, I cannot be part of your support group for weight loss, but I'm part of your support group for other things. You know, we can, those are complicated things to navigate and we each have to know how, what we can give to support other people and what we need to keep ourselves safe.